Welcome back to the Detect Crime Series webinar presented by Serialize. This webinar has come out of the excellent work that the scholars of the Detect project have produced over the last three years. The Detect project is an international research initiative that is funded by the EU Commission and brings together some 18 institutions across Europe. So, for the final two episodes in this series, we're sitting down with four of the scholars to discuss an important aspect of that research that also happens to be of great interest to screenwriters diversity in crime series. So far, we've really only been talking about the white, middle-aged male detective and his criminal counterpart. And for good reason. Traditionally, white men have been, at least numerically, at the forefront of TV production. But things are changing, so it's time to ask, how are female detectives portrayed? Where do we encounter other minorities, such as LGBT characters or people of color in crime series? Let's see what our experts have to say. The tech scholar Elena D'Amelio says that in recent years there has been an explosion of female-centered crime series in Italy. We now see more female detectives in a profession that has traditionally been very male-dominated. She and her colleague Valentina Re have looked at the portrayal of female detectives in Italian crime series such as Voiceless, Imata Darani, La Lieva, Covare's Baby and Non Uccidere. However, in many of these series, female detectives have a tendency to be portrayed at either extreme of the gender spectrum. Maybe we can talk about two kinds of patterns um, and, and, and uh, in, in terms of gender representations that are positioned on two opposite um, side of a spectrum. So on one side, uh, there is the hyper-feminine female detectives who is, always, who is often not a professional, but an amateur detective. And, uh, um, and, and, and often her passion for uh, investigative matters are counterbalanced by a heavily, uh, a plot um, heavily, um, uh, uh, like a, a, a romance plot. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, for example, um, of uh, La Lieva. Um, a very like a very popular Italian uh, TV crime, uh, TV romance crime series, if we can define it like that, where um, the, the the female detective is like um, a amateur uh, detective and uh, is a little bit like Grey's Anatomy. The, the 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 investigative plot is secondary in respect to sentimental twists. Uh, uh, of triangles um, and so on. In La Lieva, medical student Alice Alevi has no idea what the future holds for her or what field of medicine to specialize in. However, after the death of her non as caregiver, Alice decides to pursue forensic medicine. As she pursues her passion for investigating mysterious crime cases, she also follows her romantic interests, falling for a doctor at the institute where she's studying and for a fellow student. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the hyper, what we call the hyper-masculine female detective. So uh, a female detective uh, who has all the characteristics of the tough guy, uh, film noir uh, persona. In Covada's baby, private detective Georgia Cantini investigates the tangled affairs of unhappily married couples. Georgia smokes too much, exercises too little, eats on the run, and is a messy housekeeper. Elena says that too often female detectives are portrayed as incomplete. If they're successful at their job, they're often deficient in other areas. How can we find a happy medium in between two extremes? I mean, is it possible to have a female detective that is, uh, who is uh, um, very good at their job, who is a professional, but doesn't have to conform to masculine standard, even in an environment that Realistic that is realistically portrayed as still very uh, male-centered and often sexist. Uh, what role, for example, as the, the 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 motherhood or the family life in this scenario? Um, another thing that we um, we've been discussing: how often these female detectives have uh, horrible family lives, or like. You know, they come from dysfunctional families. They have childhood trauma. Uh, they cannot. Um, they cannot fulfill. You know, they don't have a, um, a relaxing, stable, stable. Um, you know, family life. Uh, 
uh, they uh, they have issues in socialization, socialization, for example, and of course here I'm talking about, about the bridge and the killing. And so it seems like because they're so good at their job, they have to pay for it. Are there any characters that could serve as a model for the positive portrayal of female detectives? Imma Tatarani is a bit, to, to, to us, Valentina, is a, is a very original um, uh, blend of uh, um, female detective who has uh, who is stronger, is independent, uh, doesn't care about looks, uh, like Sarah Loon, for example, in, in The Killing, um, but at the same time as a very um, uh, loving, fulfilling uh, family life. She's married. She has a she has a daughter. Of course, she has issues with the daughter, but because they're in the the daughter is in their teenage years, so it's like. Is normal, you know, it's, it's a normal family life. It's not dysfunctional, it's not traumatic. Uh, and, um, and she is able to, uh, um, she, she is able to basically put these two spheres, the professional and the private, in dialogue and be able to function as a responsible citizen in both. Like everywhere else, Italian crime shows have seen the influence of the Nordic noir models. Elena says that the female lead are voiceless inhabits familiar tropes from Nordic noir adapted for a Mediterranean audience. They downplay their femininity, they, uh, they're, not, they're not well dressed, let's put it the way, or they don't care about appearances and so on, um, especially in voiceless. Uh, uh, Cristiana Capotondi is always uh, with a ponytail, leather jacket, uh, you know, he, 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 um, she uh, project this uh, tough guy persona, uh, and would, and also um, she sleeps around. For example, she doesn't have like uh, you know a partner, and uh, but at the same time, um, she's also very, let's say, um, she's also very caring and motherly towards her female. Um, and female partners towards the sister. So she has to carry this maternal role in uh, her family, with her colleagues, uh, uh, even with the, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the, the people she interviewed for to investigate, of course, the crimes. Um, and, and that I think uh, uh, can be, for example, um, um, a, a characteristic of uh, uh, more Mediterranean setting, like the warmth, uh, the the connection to the to, to the feeling, to the emotion of uh, um, you know the the, the 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 other the people around you. Uh, at the same time, do retaining this this idea of the strong female detective that comes from different uh, cultural models. Of course, female characters have never been absent from crime fiction. More often than not, women show up as the beautiful corpse at the start of the story. Violence against women is as old as crime fiction itself. In Voiceless, Inspector Eva Cantini returns to her hometown to assist her younger sister, Rachele, the single mother of little Matteo. She soon investigates the reported disappearance of Gioia Scuderi, a 26-year-old beauty pageant contestant whom Eva had briefly run into a few days earlier. Eva's suspicion that Gioia was kidnapped is confirmed tragically when Eva discovers the girl's body doing an underwater dive. Elena says that it was important to the creators of the show to imbue the female characters with dignity and agency. In Voiceless, um, we have a very, very careful and sensitive treatment of the victims and the rape survivors. And this was something that we were happy to discover was not only in our eyes, through the close the textual analysis of the series, but was uh, thought out uh, since the beginning because we had the chance to interview the producers, the screenwriters, uh, the director, and everyone said that at the beginning of the brainstorming, when they had you know they had to to, to sell the idea and to develop the the the, the uh, the screenplay, etc. The idea was that uh, they wanted a series that was centered on a female, uh, a female detective, but was also that should be also centered on a respectful depiction, depictions of the victim and the rape survivors. And I think in that case, Voiceless is very successful. 
We don't have naked bodies. The violence is never represented. Um, and uh, there is also a lot of agency given to the um, rape survivors. In the end, the mastermind behind the crimes is revealed to be a woman. But she's not the femme fatale or the monstrous crazy woman. Rather, Elena says, the villain herself is trapped in the ramifications of gender violence. In this way, the show spells out one of the most hidden truths, that male violence is pervasive and endemic to society. Elena concludes that female-driven crime shows turn the traditional male perspective around. The woman is no longer here simply to be looked at or subject to the male gaze. The female detective, the female villain, and even the rape victim gain agency of their own as well as their own point of view. In shows such as Voiceless and Netflix is unbelievable, the male gaze gives way to the female gaze. Yet screenwriters still have work to do. I think right now, at least in the, in, in the past series that I've been analyzing, is that there is a, a kind of taking for granted that a female, uh, that the women can be detectives, right? So it's not like in the 70s where they had to fight a very masculine, sexist environment because there were not many of them and they were still, uh, um, there was also a lot of resistance of, for them to, 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 to basically have men's job. Right now it's more like, at least superficially, accepted that a woman can do any kind of job she wants. But because of that, I think exactly, there are certain underlying sexism that is not addressed. Um, one thing, for example, one, I would say one theoretical lens that we can use to analyze that is post-feminism, right? The idea that um, feminism is now is taken for granted and that, um, you know, women have reached gender equality and so everything is fine is not. And Voiles, um, uh, for example, but also Ima Tatarani addressed that the idea that uh, there's still a lot to fight, but it's even maybe more difficult to fight that because, in theory, on paper, like we're all the same, we're all uh, we're all equal, and that can also be something to move on to, like. Since we take, since we we know now that women can be detectives and women can do men's job, then maybe we can add complexity uh, to the portrayal of uh, female characters without, without uh, you know resorting to extreme stereotypes on one end or the other. Sadly, women characters are not the only ones to have suffered from poor stereotyping. The tech scholar Alvaro Luna says that stereotyping is a feature that has been employed for all kinds of characters. We go back to the etymology of stereotype is it is a solid um, impression, right? It's an impression that has been fixed for many generations, right? This applies to people of color. We can think about so many colonial tropes of, um, of people from Africa. We can think about so many sexist representations of women from, uh, from the 19th century. Um, so those images have been um, and solidified in, in our in the European uh, in imagery, right? So, so to the point that it is difficult to 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 fix them, right? To do to unfix them, to un to uh, to think them differently. Alvaro notes that the question of how to portray and cast minorities has been prevalent for a long time in the arts, but this is not a question of how to portray minorities, but rather of how to represent society at large. I was thinking about how how this um, idea of minorities in television, when we think about them, when, we, when screenwriters ask me, this question happened to me, uh, was asked to me um, this summer, um, how do, how should we portray and, and cast minorities in our, in, our, in our series? I personally felt that that question was not very uh, contemporary today. We shouldn't be asking how can we present the, uh, minorities because I feel that this is a way to distinguish us from them. I feel that, uh, as I mentioned, we should be asking how can we present uh, our society, right? So our society, uh, and by saying our society is by including all, all of them in one, right? So um, by present by you you by including a woman character or. Um, 
a Franco Maghrebi character, right? Um, we're also representing France itself. We're also representing our communities. It's something that I I, I always want to emphasize, right? That um, for, yeah, France has never been uh, white, has never been male only, right? Uh, since the beginning of time. So I feel that people should be more conscious about about that when creating their their series. One of the minorities conspicuously absent, at least in the lead roles, is the LGBT community. The gay or lesbian, let alone transgender detective, is a rarity on European television. If these characters show up in crime shows at all, they're either a murder victim, a curious suspect, or the mentally unstable villain. Alvaro says he can only think of one series that features a gay detective, the Netflix show Dogs of Berlin. In Germany, there's Docs of Berlin, which is a Netflix series where the lead investigator, well, the co-lead, um, he's a Turkish German um, investigator who happens to be gay. Um, and uh, and what is interesting is that um, how um, queerness is also um, treated in, in, in the story as well, right? How, um, which I believe is something that uh, by, by lis listening to Elena's uh, uh, discussion on this, it's, it's very interesting to see several, so many different um, patterns as well happening. So when we're talking about minority cultures, right? We, uh, in mainstream television, we need to always be, uh, I, I, I put myself in the shoes of the screenwriters, right? And of course, we, we need to create a store for mainstream uh, audiences, right? So we need to also bring a characters that people can identify with, right? The question with, with queer characters is, um, of course, uh, how can you present queerness in a way that it is acceptable as well uh, to, to mainstream audiences? How, how could it be subversive as well, right? So there's always, this, it has to be, this, I, I feel there's some, sometimes this balance. The lack in television is somewhat surprising given that literary crime fiction is much more at ease with featuring queer protagonists. But detect scholar Federico Pagello makes an important distinction between television and literary production. As usual, television needs a lot of money to be produced, whereas uh, uh, books just need one person to write and a very few people to read it to make it sustainable. <laughs> so the fact of doing not only something radical, but something that address minorities, if they are really minorities, requires on the part of the producer and the audience, uh, um, not just, it's not an issue of identifying, so finding your identity represented but being open to other identities uh, or to discover your own <laughs> queerness that you never thought about before. <laughs> That's not exactly what people do on the couch at night when they turn on a crime show by a mainstream <laughs> television. LGBT characters are not the only ones that suffer from poor representation on screen. Detect scholar Monica Dalasta reports that the autistic community has also been concerned with the representation of its members on screen. She notes that the analytical detective archetype lends itself to being presented as an autistic person. In literature, these were mostly male characters. For this reason, the representation of Sagan Oren in The Bridge was quite groundbreaking in that respect. Yet there are questions that remain. And what, what comes out in the, in, in, in the, in the debate, there is a, a huge debate that you have in the autistic communities uh, about this representation. They actually criticize a lot uh, the many stereotypes that surround the representation of the detective as an autistic savant because they say not all autistic people, not all autistic people are savant, not all autistic people are so intelligent and have this uh, huge memory and so on. But more than this, what they are interested in is the possibility to have autistic actors um, playing autistic characters. And so this is something that uh, I consider very, very, very um, uh, suggest I mean, um, suggestive, um, of course. And of course, this also involves the way how screen, uh, how, this, uh, how TV scripts are written, uh, what kind of research you do, 
uh, what kind of relation you create with a real, actual autistic community. Representation of minorities on screen is not just a matter of writing. Actors and actresses also play a large role, no pun intended, in depicting minority characters. But not all parts are created equal. Federico sees a significant difference for actors in portraying a queer character versus a disabled or impaired character. Again, commercial issues really matters and celebrities and stars have a gender identity that is part of their capital value, of their economic values because like Alieva <laughs> shows very well female and male actor and actresses are valued by the audience uh, according to the kind of uh, fantasies of maleness or female femininity that they embody. So definitely an audience that is interested in the quality, the aesthetic, technical quality of an actor or an actress that embodies a, any kind of identity would appreciate their ability to choose that, to change that. And performing disability has always been, or traumatic uh, traumas of any kind, has always been how actor and actresses won the Oscar. Uh, but of course, uh, gender identities and sexual orientations is a different kind of things. Uh, and, uh, and probably it's more difficult to include it in a, a commercially viable <laughs> um, profile. Uh, of the actor. But I would say, as we can see in many American TV shows, the stigma of portraying a gay or lesbian character has largely disappeared for actors. In large ensemble shows, it's almost a given now that at least one character will be gay or lesbian with a fulfilled or at least an equally complicated personal life as their heterosexual colleagues. I can think of shows such as Grey's Anatomy, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Modern Family, Orphan Black, or How to Get Away with Murder to name just a few. But even European shows such as La Casa de Papel, Elite or Killing Eve feature leading queer characters and complex storylines concerning them. Who knows, maybe before long we'll see the detective who happens to be lesbian or gay with a fulfilled personal life. Something to think about as you conceive your own crime series. In addition to this webinar, we're also organizing a contest for new original series ideas for either broadcast or streaming services. The proposed show should challenge and push the genre in un unexpected ways and use crime narratives to explore the richness and complexity of European societies. An international jury of top professionals from the broadcast and streaming industries will review the top five submissions. The winning author or team of authors will be invited to attend the DETECT final conference in Rome in June 2021 and meet the members of the jury. You can go to the link in the show notes of this episode to find out more about this contest. <music>